This is WRAL News at 7 with special coverage of coronavirus. Facts, not fear. New numbers and projections for North Carolina tonight prompting state leaders to make a big decision when it comes to flattening the curve. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Gerald Owens. And I'm Deborah Morgan. Tonight, David Crabtree talks live with one of those researchers about these findings and what they mean for all of us. And taking a look at the numbers, North Carolina is pushing closer to 3,000 with more than 2,900 confirmed coronavirus cases. 270 people are hospitalized and 44 people have died with 14 of those coming over the weekend. We're also working alongside the state to track and let you know about the number of recovered cases. We know of 124 people who have recovered. However, we likely have many more since not all counties are reporting these numbers. Another big headline in North Carolina today. Researchers at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill now have a new drug going into trials for possible treatment. Ralph Barrick, head of the lab known globally for its testing production, will join us live coming up in the next 50 15 minutes to talk about this milestone. Some other headlines at this hour. Former Vice President and current Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden spoke with President Trump about the response. Another stimulus deal could be in the works. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi told CNN the House is prepared to pass at least a trillion dollar rescue package. WRO's Mark Boyle is in the Live Center keeping a close eye on today's White House Coronavirus Task Force briefing. Mark. That briefing is still going on right now, Gerald. You see the president speaking here behind me in my monitor to my left here. In addition to those headlines and those bullet points that you were just referencing, President Trump also talking about how the Comfort, that ship that's docked there in New York City, is now going to be taking patients who have COVID-19. It's COVID-19 ready. At first, it was just going to be there to help the overflow. Now it's going to be helping those who need it the most, according to President Donald Trump. These are the latest numbers from the Johns Hopkins University, a map of COVID-19 patients confirmed around the globe, 1.3 million cases of coronavirus. The number of total deaths is close to 75,000. I want to show you this number here for the United States. Confirmed cases for us, 362. When I tap on this, it'll switch. We just topped 10,000 deaths here in the United States for cases. Again, this map shows all of the highlighted areas, New York, Boston, D.C., all of those in red there to South Florida and Miami still going to be those epicenters in New Orleans for where they're trying to, again, flatten the curve of the coronavirus here tonight. Back to you. Thank you, Mark. New projections out today show if North Carolina relaxes the current social distancing guidelines, 750,000 people could be infected with COVID-19 by the end of May. The team, including researchers from Duke and UNC, already predicts 250,000 infections with the current guidelines in place. Governor Cooper's stay-at-home order is set to expire April 30th. The study shows if that happens, hospitals will likely run out of space and supplies. So what we need to do to save lives in North Carolina is make sure that that peak doesn't come fast and furious and really tall. We need to flatten the curve. That means the, what we know works to flatten the curve is social distancing. Updated statistics from the University of Washington show the peak for deaths in North Carolina will likely happen April 15th with 30 deaths per day. That's next Wednesday. The report estimates we will have about 500 deaths by August, which is down from their first prediction of 2,400 deaths. We have one of the North Carolina researchers joining us now to explain what this means. Dr. Mark Holmes with the Gillings School of Public Health at UNC Chapel Hill. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Holmes. One of the things that uh, struck us today on this call was how the research team compared the modeling we're seeing to something many of us are familiar here with. We're talking hurricane models, those spaghetti plots. Yet sometimes we watch those plots and there's a rogue plot that goes out there. Uh, how do you know which of the models to put your faith in? Well, that's exactly the uh, issue with all these complex models and whether it's modeling hurricanes or a pandemic of a novel virus, it's uh, challenging to figure out what, where it's gonna go. And in both cases, we're drawing from years of history of science, in one case epidemiological and another meteorological. Um, but in, in both cases, we're trying to look at the multiple options and figure out where the consensus looks. Sometimes the tracks can be all over the place uh, and be highly variable, and sometimes they might agree on uh, a couple features of the prediction. And We have more faith and confidence in the places where they agree, and where they spread out, we have to recognize that there's uncertainty. You know, uncertainty, what a word, because two months ago, I don't think any of us had ever heard of social distancing. 
And now it's the one thing the researchers are all agreeing on. The numbers again estimated today, if we continue the policies of social distancing, by the end of next month, a quarter of a million cases here. If we don't, 750,000 may seem obvious. Why even thinking about, think about lifting this when we know how severe it could be? So the group of, that I worked with, um, it, it was, we all just basically, once this started happening in North Carolina, we all raised our hands and said, we wanna do something, how do we volunteer? Um, one of the things that we, we knew that from the beginning, we were looking at this from a public health standpoint. We have, well, how do we flatten the curve? What happens if we do? What happens if we don't? Do, are we gonna have enough hospital beds, enough ICU beds? So we had a really pretty narrow charge in that respect. And that was to project where we would go under multiple policies and scenarios. And uh, what if it's uh, more infectious than we think? What if it's a little less infectious? Uh, and so our charge was, and our, our role was to figure out the public health projections. Policymakers have to step in and recognize that there are trade-offs. Um, you know, social distancing and, and what we're doing today is, has a cost to our economy. And we have to balance uh, saving lives from a uh, pandemic standpoint from the multiple other things that, that happens in a society every day. And just like Department of Defense has a uh, charge to look at national security and National Hurricane Center looks at hurricanes. Uh, in this case, we were looking at uh, the coronavirus. Okay, and we know the governor's supporting your findings. State lawmakers are looking at what you're finding. As you look to the South, we've got a pretty good sized border with South Carolina. They don't have the same order in place that we have, although there are some restrictions in place. How concerned are you when you see us bordering a state that is not doing what's happening here? So there are multiple ways that, well, if, let's look back at, at the spread of where the, um, uh, uh, cases that we've been found are across the state. And while many of them are in Mecklenburg and uh, our other urban centers, other of them are seeded throughout. Northampton uh, for a while was one of the highest per capita rates in the state. Um, and so recognizing that the, uh, the virus can show up in places that we don't expect and whether it's through a state border uh, from our south or from uh, a, a traveler from uh, coming to see family or someone who's coming home from um, you know, some other location, these, uh, this virus is highly infectious. And uh, the, the degree to which we can limit the opportunities for it to spread uh, is our, our best tool in the quiver. Dr. Holmes, one last question for you. You live here, you work here, you care about this community. What keeps you up to, at night as a researcher? I think the fact that there are multiple models that are out there, I think is a real testament to how quickly the uh, research community has gotten engaged and, and uh, everyone wants to do something and pull from what they've done in the past. I think uh, when we tie our analysis and our conclusions to one particular model, well, we can, um, uh, we need to recognize that there's a variety of truths that we can call, uh, call from. That's one reason that we had these multiple spaghetti models, so to speak. So as you mentioned from the beginning, David, when one of them started to go off in a, in a rogue area, we kind of said, okay, we're not really sure where that one's going, but these other two seem to be lining up here. Um, putting too much stock in one particular model, I think we need, to, we need to look at the balance of them and they all have some value. Dr. Mark Holmes of the University of North Carolina, researcher, thank you for your time, the work you're doing, and we hope to talk with you again. Thank you, David. It's fascinating. Well, we yeah. could be one step closer to treating COVID-19. We will speak with Dr. Ralph Barrett from UNC, one of the leading researchers in a new possible treatment now heading to trials. This is WRAL News special coverage, facts, not fear. Some national and international headlines today. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been moved to intensive care after his symptoms worsened. The 55-year-old was admitted to the hospital on Sunday. Xerox plans to produce disposable ventilators, as many as 40,000 this month alone. Now, this device is not a replacement for hospital-approved ventilators, but they could help save lives when there are shortages. Within the past 15 minutes, we learned Wisconsin's primary scheduled for tomorrow cannot be moved. 
The court overruled the governor's decision, who tried to move it to June. And retainers from all backgrounds from all around the world will come together for a global concert next week in support of health care workers and the fight against coronavirus. The World Health Organization made the announcement this morning. NBC plans to broadcast the event scheduled for April 18th at 8 p.m. Artists such as Lady Gaga, Elton John, and Keith Urban will all be part of this. All three big names in late Stole night, Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, and Stephen Colbert okay. will host the benefit. A new drug is headed to clinical trials offering hope in treating COVID-19, and researchers at UNC are at the forefront for making it happen. Joining us now to talk more about this milestone is Dr. Ralph Barrick, Professor of Epidemiology at the UNC School of Public Health. Dr. Barrick, thanks for being with us again. When you joined us last week, you hinted at some big news coming soon. Here we are just days later and your lab is doing it again. Tell our viewers what this means and how excited we should be. Well, thank you, David. Thanks for inviting me again. Uh, I love being on your program and uh, I think it's critical the kind of information you're providing the, pro the, the public. Uh, we, uh, uh, in collaboration with a uh, group in Emory and Vanderbilt University, uh, identified a new drug called NHC or uh, EIDD 2801. This is a orally bioavailable drug, so you can take a pill, and it works uh, to uh, block uh, SARS-2 virus replication, uh, not only in uh, primary human airway cells uh, and other cells of the uh, of the lung but also uh, to block virus replication and pathogenesis in animal models of human disease. So this drug is uh, very effective and quite potent and ha shows very nice results in vivo. Dr. Barrick, certainly people are just trying to cling on to any ray of hope in, in ending this virus. So how confident are you and your researchers with this new drug? Well, with any new drug, you can only be as confident as the data that you have at the time, which is uh, primarily in animals. Uh, the important, one really important aspect is we've shown that the, the drug works in the primary targets that the virus infects in the human lung. And so we know if the drug makes it to the human lung, it should be very effective at blocking virus replication. But obviously, we won't know those results until uh, uh, human trials begin. And uh, currently this drug has uh, been licensed by Emory to a company called uh, uh, Ridgeback uh, Biosciences. Um, the drug has been approved by the FDA to begin human trials and actually should start human trials this week in England in phase one studies that really look at toxicity. And uh, if those data look good, it will begin to move into more uh, serious uh, trials with uh, COVID-19 patients. What kind of timing then are we looking at as far as when it could actually be used in humans? Well, typically um, the drug will be available uh, probably through compassionate use if the phase one trials and toxicity studies uh, look good. Uh, and then there will also be um, a clinical trials that will be conducted probably in the US and in Europe and elsewhere that are currently under design. Uh, those results uh, take about a month and a half uh, especially in an expanding outbreak. So uh, obviously it's not immediate relief and not an immediate solution to the problem of infection, but it uh, does offer hope for the future. Mm -hmm. Dr. Barrick, we have seen companies and research groups coming together for a common goal of finding a vaccine for this virus, whereas before this, they might be competitors. How important is this collaboration in finding a cure or a vaccine for this virus? Well, it's really an amazing uh, consortium of, of researchers and companies across the globe that are working together and communicating results prior to publication. I sit on uh, conference calls with members from the, with the WHO that has a, a global outreach to countries all over the world where people share, da share data. Uh, also, the National Institute of Health here in the U.S. has a similar uh, ser series of conference calls where data is shared among investigators. And it really has provided an uh, incredible uh, outreach uh, a mechanism to collaborate and uh, to um, allow you to integrate your own science into findings that other people have had around the world. And, and that's truly novel and, and critically important for global health. Well, that's great to see.
It, it is fantastic. And if we're talking about weeks, not months mm -hmm. or years before we can actually get a treatment that will be useful, it is very exciting. Dr. Ralph Barrick, an epidemiologist for UM, from UNC Chapel Hill, thank you so much for your time and all that you're doing to try to help people through this crisis. Yes. Thank you for having me here. All right. Coming up on Facts Not Fear, changes to the way we travel. The new insight from travel experts about the uphill climb the travel industry as a whole is expected to face. The president's task force still continues right now. Uh, Vice President Mike Pence is speaking. The president just left, so he is finished for the afternoon. But one of the big takeaways that I was just listening to, that if you're a sports fan, this could be of interest to you. The president says he is working with the organizations, including the NFL and the Major League Baseball group, to get fans back in the stands, get these games up and operational in the near future. He even said he hopes that football could start on time. That is still a big question mark, he says, but that's what he's working for. In addition to the information coming out of here today, if you're just now joining us here, uh, the Comfort, the ship in New York City, is now going to be used for COVID-19 patients. So that's new this afternoon. Uh, Joe Biden called the president today as well. They spoke for about 15 minutes. The president said that he appreciated the call. It was a good call. But again, the information coming out today, more of uh, reassuring Americans that ventilators, masks are on the way and companies like 3M are making sure there's enough to go around. Back to you. Thank you, Mark. The airline and travel industry is suffering greatly from this pandemic. The CDC was quick to issue travel alerts, warnings, and advisories as it became clear this would have a far-reaching impact. To give you an idea, United Airlines cut 90% of its flights in and out of New York City and New Jersey. United flights in Newark dropped from 139 to just 15, serving nine destinations instead of 62. LaGuardia Airport transitioned from 18 flights per day to just two. Again, this is just one airline. And it's hard to imagine this. Air traffic at RDU is down nearly 100% compared to this time last year. On April 2nd, last Thursday, TSA only screened 781 passengers at Raleigh-Durham International. With so many trips canceled and no crystal ball as to when life will return to normal, how do we know when it will be safe to travel again? Should we hold off on canceling? And what do you do if you can't reach your airline? Here to discuss the latest impacts on the travel industry is travel expert Francesca Page. Thank you so much for joining us, Francesca. Yeah, Francesca. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Normally, you're talking to us about the best trips to book and when, but this is something new for you. What's the biggest concern that you're hearing from people right now about air travel? Well, I think it's safe to say that people are not jumping to book trips for the immediate future. But the biggest question people are asking is, should I cancel an upcoming trip? And if so, what is the best way to do it so I don't lose money? Yes. So at what point do you go ahead and pull the plug on an upcoming trip? And, you know, you can assume that April and May certainly probably out of the question. But what about summer trips? Well, the travel industry is extremely shaken right now, and no one can really predict when this will pass. What we do know is that non-essential travel during this present time is not recommended. Now, since most of the country is ordered to shelter in place, I think it's best to plan trips many months ahead towards at least the end of the summer, rather than rushing to the airport as soon as restrictions are lifted. Also, keep in mind less exposed travel ideas like a road trip to visit the family. It'll give everyone something to look forward to, obviously, after months apart from one another. People are calling their uh, travel agents and they're calling customer service lines at the airlines in droves. How are the airlines doing when it comes to responding to customers? Right, well, I think that most airlines are struggling to handle, understandably, the mass amount of communication requests they're receiving from travelers regarding changes or cancellations to upcoming trips. A lot of people are complaining that of not being able to reach airlines, but the good news is that many airlines like Delta, for instance, are aware of how jammed the call centers are and are automatically issuing refunds or credits on missed or canceled flights. Of course, this policy varies by airline. So failing all this, keep in mind that the Federal Fair Credit Billing Act gives you the right to dispute a charge for services not provided. So if you can't reach anyone, contact your bank who is required to protect you. What, you sh what should you go after, a reimbursement or a travel credit with an airline? Good question. Well, you've got to remember that airlines want to keep your business. When a flight is canceled, airline systems usually rebook you on the closest available flight and assume you accept the changes unless you state otherwise. Now, for non-commitment, 
rental travelers that offer credit vouchers for future flights. Well, all these options provide far more flexibility than the standard change and cancellation fees that customers are used to. You've got to remember that despite this flexibility, these options are still in the best interest of the airlines. So by rebooking you or offering vouchers for future travel, airlines actually hold on to your business and keep your cash. So instead of accepting a voucher or date change now, I recommend to hold off until 72 hours before your trip in case you eventually qualify for a refund. And then what do you do if your flight is not canceled? So many flights are being canceled, but what if it's still a go? Right. Well, cancellation and refund terms very much depend on the individual airline, with some being more consumer friendly than others. So now as the number of COVID-19 cases rise, I would assume that the current travel waivers in place will continue to be extended and offer more favorable terms. So if you hold on to your reservation so that the airline calls the cancellation before you do, this is actually going to increase your chances of being entitled to a refund. So if the current policy does not appeal to you, my recommendation, wait it out. <laughs> All right. Great advice. Travel expert Francesca Page, thank you so much. Thank you. So what about those spring trips to the Carolina coast? Last week, Five on Your Side introduced you to a family who said that they were not able to get a refund for an Easter week trip. Well, that changed when we stepped in because a no visitor declaration is in place for Dare County. The company had to comply and later said they would issue a refund. You can find this story and the statement from the North Carolina Real Estate Commission right now on WRL.com. Our news team here at WRL has taken steps recommended by the CDC to make sure we are safe in our efforts to keep you informed. Hear from several members of our news team discussing how we're making changes in our latest episodes of How to Commit Journalism, available wherever you download your podcasts. It is a unique look inside our business, and we are also providing daily podcast updates in our North Carolina coronavirus podcast briefs. They're available wherever you download your podcasts. Thank you for watching tonight and for making us your choice for local news. Our next newscast is at 10 on Fox 50, and then we'll see you again at 11 right here on WREL. Have a great night, everybody. Stay well.